Uh, my name is Philip Munoz. I'm a political science uh, professor, and it's my pleasure to welcome you. Can you, we don't have a microphone for the room. Can you hear me okay in the back? It's okay? Okay. So Andrew, if, uh, if our speaker is not projecting well enough, can you just signal him? Uh, today's lecture is sponsored by uh, Notre Dame's new undergraduate what? minor in constitutional oh, studies. Oh, yeah, go sure. So for those undergraduates here, uh, if you might be interested in the minor, please come talk to me after the talk. Or Jen Smith uh, here in the front row. She's a program assistant. Please talk to her. We have some flyers, too, that explains the minor's course of study. Are those flyers, flyers in the back corner? Uh, we also have copies of Professor Smith's uh, anthology of Lincoln's writings. You probably saw them as you walked in at the bookstore in Sally Mose, and I'm sure Professor Smith will sign them afterwards if, if you like. Um, the Constitutional Studies program has many friends, and I want to recognize two of our benefactors this afternoon. Uh, the Frank Potenziani family, um, the initial gift that basically has allowed us to come into being. Uh, and the miners named for his son David Potenziani, a 2001 graduate of Notre Dame. Uh, let me also recognize uh, the Jack Miller Center for their uh, support for our programs. Um, two other people to thank, uh, Professor Body. Professor Body. Thank you very much uh, for all you've done to help make uh, today's event possible. And then, and then Jen, my, Jen Smith, my assistant, she does all the work uh, for these events, so thank you very much, uh, Jen. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was born on this day uh, in 1809. Uh, believe it or not, he actually might not be the most famous professor uh, person born on that day. Anyone else know who was born on? Darwin was born also on the same day as Lincoln. Uh, but in the Constitutional Studies program, we don't actually celebrate Darwin. to change your lecture and we rightfully celebrate Lincoln today because without Lincoln, uh, we likely would not be here uh, as a nation. Uh, just a personal note, I became interested in political science through reading Lincoln's lectures. It was uh, my junior year in college. There's probably a lot of junior undergraduates here. You know how at the end of the semester when you return all the library books that you did not read um, for your term paper? Well, I wrote a term paper on Lincoln and checked out every book in the library on Lincoln read none of them, and returned them one by one into the library, the, the box drop outside the library. And it was actually very painful because I thought, I actually want to read these books. Uh, and I happened to have a meeting with my undergraduate advisor that afternoon, and I said, told him, I just returned all these books uh, on Lincoln, which I wish I had the time to read. He says, well, that's what you do in graduate school. Uh, so for you undergraduates here, or graduate students, make sure you take a class on Lincoln before you graduate. Uh, you owe it to yourself. Uh, and I think if you do, you will find an example of what human greatness uh, looks like in this world. Uh, we're fortunate to have a great speaker, a great scholar with us to discuss Lincoln today. So let me introduce Jake Greffenstead, yes. uh, a uh, first year student here from Fisher Hall. Uh, Jake is uh, Notre Dame's freshman class vice president. Uh, I'm sure he's looking forward to minoring in constitutional studies, and he'll introduce uh, our speaker today. Thank you, Good evening, everyone. I'm Jake Raffenset, class of 2016, and it is my honor to pr introduce Professor Stephen Smith, who joins us today from Yale University. Professor Smith is the Alfred Coles Professor of Political Science and the recipient of the Lex Hickson Prize for Teaching Excellence in the Social Sciences. Our distinguished guest has served as acting chair of Judaic Studies at Yale, spent over 10 years as a master of Branford College, and has published over five acclaimed works of political philosophy. His impressive student history capped in his PhD studies at U Chicago, and he has since held a number of research positions at Yale, where he has taught since 1984. His 2012 publication, The Writings of Abraham Lincoln, has been held as an excellent anthology and will serve as a foundation for today's discussions. Professor Smith is known to be extremely passionate about the respective histories of political science, government, and the Yankees. I also note that when he isn't cheering for Yale to be Harvard, he is said to be rooting for the Irish. Please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Smith to our campus today. 
Thank you very much for those, for those lovely and, and kind words. And I'm glad you were able to work in the Yankees in, my, uh, in, the, in, the, in the introduction. And the Irish. I was really, I have to say, I was uh, really pulling for you guys in that uh, war against Alabama. But that's, a, no. <laughs> I guess that's another story. But uh, yeah, uh, let me just, before I, I begin today, let me say, uh, first of all, what a thrill it is for me to be here at Notre Dame. Uh, I was here once about a decade ago, and uh, I love being at a place where, I'll just say, liberal learning in the old-fashioned sense of the term is taken so seriously, and uh, I, I love that about this, this campus. And it is also a thrill for me to be here uh, speaking on Abraham Lincoln's birthday. I mean, how, how often can you say you've done that? Uh, maybe, maybe once in a lifetime, uh, at least for me. So uh, those two things make this, for me, a very special event. I want to talk uh, a bit today about what I call Abraham Lincoln's constitutional leadership. And just to warn you, I want to do it uh, a bit as by, by means of a sort of walking tour of some various uh, different kind of approaches to the question of, of, of political leadership. What kind of leader was Abraham Lincoln? This is a question that every student of Lincoln who has ever considered the question has to ask. There's virtual consensus that Lincoln was an exemplary leader, but opinions differ on the lessons to be drawn from his leadership. Did he exert features of moral grandeur and heroism necessary to steer the country through its deepest political crisis? Or was he, as his critics believed at the time, and perhaps in some ways still do, an aspiring tyrant, especially in his use of executive power to achieve his ends? A recent example of how not to think about Lincoln's leadership comes from the historian and television commentator Doris Kearns Goodwin. Uh, Doris Goodwin, of course, wrote, as probably most of you know, a Pulitzer Prize winning book, an excellent book called Team of Rivals, The Political Genius of Abraham Lincoln, showing how Lincoln organized his cabinet out of his personal and political competitors. This also, as probably most of you know, was a kind of organizing theme of Steven Spielberg's magnificent new film, Lincoln, in which uh, Doris Goodwin is prominently figured as a source. But in a subsequent discussion, certainly subsequent to her book, uh, discussion of Lincoln's leadership titled 10 Qualities That Made Lincoln great. And doesn't it always uh, strike you as odd that somehow these people are always able to find ten qual you know, the perfect round number for the number of qualities that contributed to Lincoln's greatness. She enumerated what she believed were the key features leading to Lincoln's success. Among them are such things as an ability to learn on the job, the capacity to listen to different points of view, and my own favorite one, knowing how to relax and replenish. <laughs> Since uh, probably most of you know that Lincoln's principal form of relaxation was going to the theater, it turns out that probably wasn't such great advice. Uh, but in any case, uh, if all of these sound a little too much like a set of recommendations for a modern day CEO, you would be right. This list was drawn from a keynote address given to the annual conference of the SHRM. What is that, you ask? It is the Society for Human and Resource Management, uh, a lecture given in Chicago in 2008. I am sure that a giant of Lincoln's stature uh, would be gratified to know that his model could be used for modern day resource managers in, in organizing their work. But in order to understand really what makes Lincoln a political leader, it's necessary to go really beyond simply listing a set, set of relatively generic character traits that could be used to describe virtually any successful man or woman in whatever walk of life 
who has ever existed. So to understand Lincoln's leadership properly, it's necessary to understand it as a form of what I want to call in this talk constitutional leadership. And to understand at least what I mean by constitutional leadership, it's, it's necessary to, to give you a little bit of a walking tour of other models or other theories of leadership against which I want to understand Lincoln's model, Lincoln's constitutional leadership. Lincoln's distinctive style of leadership can be usefully contrasted, I think, with three others that have or can be discovered in the history of political thought. The first of these can be usefully described as the Machiavellian model of leadership, so named after the author of the most famous manual of leadership ever written, a book called The Prince that was written, as it turns out, exactly 500 years ago this very year. Machiavelli's prince is often and his model of leadership, therefore, is often described by the term real realism or realpolitik, because if you want to be taken seriously, as a, you'd have to have a journal, really, to describe <laughs> your model. It's obvious the term Machiavelli did not use. But uh, uh, realism is often taken as the opposite of idealism or utopianism. It is often taken to be synonymous with pragmatism or a shrewd sense of what will work. But in Machiavelli's language, realism would mean more than simply attention to reality, but rather that a prince or a leader who wants to do good as opposed to simply be good must be prepared to get his hands dirty. Or as Machiavelli famously said, the prince must learn how not to do good. What did he mean by that? When Machiavelli says that a prince must learn how not to be good, he means something very specific. It is a truism, of course, that a person in a leadership position must occasionally countenance departures from ordinary behavior in order to achieve their ends. But Machiavelli means more than just occasional departures from the rules of ordinary morality. He means that it is a condition of political greatness that a prince uh, must exempt himself from obedience to ordinary ethical laws and injunctions. A prince must know how to do right when he can, but he must be prepared to do evil when he must. The image of a successful prince, then, for Machiavelli, is one who is willing to adopt and employ any means necessary to achieve his ends. This may include lying and deceit, what he calls acting against faith, the selective use of cruelty, acting against humanity, and in generally a willingness to abandon all moral standards, what he calls acting against religion. It is important, he says, to appear to abide by the traditional Christian virtues of faith, hope, and charity, but the actual practice of these virtues will lead to one's ruin. The prince, in other words, or the successful leader, in other words, must be a liar, a dissembler, a man of many masks who is willing to adapt himself to the winds of fortune wherever those winds may be blowing. It's often said that Machiavelli was a teacher of t tyranny. Names like Stalin, Hitler almost invariably come to mind, but that's, that's not necessarily true. What he wants for a leader to value is, above all, glory, fame, and honor. These, he says, were the great virtues of the true political founders in history and that Machiavelli believed were most magnificently displayed in the world of great politics, especially in building up the strength of one's own country for it to play a role in the game of world history. The second model of leadership which I want to consider, is identified with the great German sociologist Max Weber, who coined, or virtually coined, the term charismatic leadership. Weber's idea of the charismatic leader was in part an answer to his lifelong question, or his lifelong pursuit of the question, what makes authority possible? Why do some people submit themselves willingly to the authority of others? A, a wonderful question. 
And his answer is that people submit to authority for three different reasons. Sometimes we submit to authority because, simply because things have always been done this way. You're done in a certain way. He called that traditional authority. Some people consent to obey the rules because there are sort of rationally established laws and procedures administered by impartial authorities. And he called that legal rational, legal rational authority. And still others, he says, are enchanted by the extraordinary grace or special qualities of a special individual. And this is what he called charismatic authority. Today, of course, in, in part because of Weber, the language of charisma has been vastly cheapened, as was vividly depicted a generation ago in Alan Bloom's famous book, The Closing of the American Mind. But Weber used the term charisma to identify a very special type of leader. He was thinking, above all, of religious figures like Moses or Buddha. Today we might include the Dalai Lama in this category, even though in popular parlance, the term is used indiscriminately to describe leaders and people of all sorts. Weber developed this theory of charismatic leadership in an essay titled Politics as a Vocation, which he addressed to a student audience shortly after World War I. And along with Machiavelli's Prince, probably only second to it, Weber's work is perhaps the second best known work on the, on the theory or problem of leadership. And here in this lecture, Weber outlined the qualities necessary for authentic political leadership. One can say, he wrote, that there are th three preeminent qualities that are decisive for the politician. Passion, a feeling of responsibility, and a sense of proportion. That was Weber. On the surface, it appears that Weber is asking his readers to follow a moderate course of action, stressing qualities like responsibility and self-control, sense of proportion. But it is in fact the first term, passion, that is the crucial one. By a passion, Weber means the devotion to a cause, or as he calls it, to the god or demon who is its overlord. You can hear the kind of theological language in which Weber <coughs> enfolded the idea of leadership. His claim that our ultimate ends, our ultimate objectives, the objects of our passionate attachments are matters of faith, somewhat like religious beliefs, as he says, choose your own god or demon. The, character, the charismatic leader is measured by the level of devotion or passionate attachment that can be mustered to defend a cause. In our terms today, we could say that for Weber, politics is a kind of faith-based enterprise, measured above all by the strength of our, of our devotion and our moral commitments. But the, but the question here is always, how does one measure the authenticity of our commitments? How does, in other words, one distinguish the charismatic leader from the demagogue or the fraud? How does one distinguish the true from the untrue prophet? This is one of the oldest questions, and frankly, Weber provides no acid test for charisma. It seems to be, in some ways, very much in the eye of the beholder. In recent American history, Ronald, the great communicator Reagan, and Barack, yes we can, Obama, are both seen as charismatic leaders, at least in the eyes of their followers, while, for example, Jimmy Carter and George H.W. Bush are not. Yet to refer to the leader's charismatic properties says little about the quality of his or her governance. There are no fixed principles of action by which to identify or define charisma beyond the demand for the authenticity of commitment or sincerity of commitment. And that leads me to the third style of leadership, which we can call, or I can call, I want to call the progressive model of the leader. The idea of the progressive leader has root, deep roots in the European Enlightenment with its belief that all the truly important problems facing human civilization, from poverty to education to health care, are technical in nature and can be solved on the basis of scientific knowledge, technical knowledge, that is or soon will be available to mankind. This idea of the leader as a kind of scientific manager 
was best summed up, in my opinion, by then-candidate Michael Dukakis's claim, as he said once, that he was interested in competence, not ideology. Now, I don't mean by this to belittle competence. Uh, we all want and expect and hope for competence in our leader. But it does suggest somehow this kind of statesman, the progressive model, is somehow above politics, is somehow above the fray, a detached observer looking on the political world in the way that, say, an ichthyologist uh, looks upon big, big fish swallowing smaller ones. This view of leadership is directly related to the rise of the prestige of the social sciences in the last century. And this kind of enlightened progressivism which is at the basis of most of our so modern day social science has generated an army of followers who can v fairly be described as progressive for their belief in the power of rational or scientific planning to produce a safe, healthy, and prosperous society. The progressive leader, and in American history, the chief examples are usually Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, typically think of politics as something subject to continual evolutionary change. And of course, the heyday of the progressive era coincided with the impact of our other birthday boy today, Darwin, and the kind of Darwinian theories of evolution and adaptation. And this old, this idea of progressive evolution set out to displace the idea that there are certain permanent natural rights of the kind enumerated, for example, in the Declaration of Independence. These seemed to progressives an outmoded way of thinking that needed to be replaced by a model of organic change. And accordingly, progressive leaders developed a theory of what they called the living constitution to show that the constitution is not a timeless document, but rather is something that needs to be interpreted in the light of the changing standards and needs of society. As societies evolve, so must constitution. The successful leader, therefore, is one who is able not only to adapt to, but rather to anticipate change as society moves in new and unforeseen directions. Rather than simply accommodating himself to change, it becomes the duty, even the obligation, of the progressive leader to work for the acceleration of progress in all dimensions of human life. In fact, there is a kind of implied immorality in not working to bring about progressive ends. To resist progress is, at the least, to be de deemed a conservative, possibly a reactionary, and at worst, an enemy of the people. That model of the progressive statesman is that of a kind of policy scientist, a planner, or an engineer. The idea that politics could be removed, or should be removed, from the messy process of democracy and become a science, a kind of administrative science, has been the constant hope of political progressives everywhere. The progressive leader must be a mouthpiece of society, always ready to interpret the public opinion or the public mood, wherever it might lead. But the question that must always be put to the model of progressive leadership is by what metric or what standard is change or progress to be measured? When do we know, for example, whether progress has met its limits? What are the limits? In American history, progressivism has taken the relatively benign form of modern welfare policies and programs. But how are we to know when exactly how much progress is enough? How do we even know that progress is actually progressive unless we have some standard by which to judge it? And to this question, I have to answer the set of questions. Progressivism has never yet found a fully satisfactory answer. Well, I could stop at this point and say, what does any of this or all of this have to do with Lincoln? Uh, I'm getting to it. <laughs> I'm getting to him, because this brings me to the fourth model of leadership that I use, that I want to call constitutional leadership, or constitutional government. Constitutionalism is one of the great themes of Western political thought, and is in many respects the unique property of the Anglo-American political tradition. From Magna Carta, habeas corpus, and the Toleration Act, 
to the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, and the Federalist Papers, there has been a slowly developing consensus over the fundamentals of constitutional government. Constitutions are fundamentally devices for controlling political power. Governing in a constitutional manner means governing with respect to forms, by which I mean certain formal procedures, such as, for example, the rule of law, due process, trial by jury, and so on. In some respects, it almost seems that constitutional government cares more about the forms than about the outcomes. What is important is that certain formal procedures be seen to be followed, and following these procedures confers legitimacy on the outcomes. But the very term constitutional leadership involves a kind of paradox. Leadership involves boldness, at least we think it typically involves boldness, decisiveness, and action, even a willingness to go it alone. While constitutions impose forms and rules, checks upon powers, and limits on executive initiative, how can, in other words, one both lead and accept the limitations of constitutional restraint. And I believe there is no one whose statecraft more vividly illustrates the tension, the necessary tension between those uh, two pol polarities than the leadership of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln stated the problem of constitutional leadership with uncommon clarity in his special message to Congress of July 4, 1861, must a government of necessity, he asked, be too strong for the liberties of its own people or too weak to maintain its own existence? I would say therein lies a topic for a seminar in Notre Dame's program in constitutional studies. But there is the problem as Lincoln fully understood it. The most essential feature, it's not the only feature, but I only want to focus today on one feature of, const of Lincoln's constitutional leadership that I think is the most important, although it's not the only feature, is idea, an idea of self-restraint. That government, constitutional government, is limited government. It's government that imposes certain restraints on itself, which I will want to show later, distinguishes it decisively from the three other models I, I spoke of earlier. Constitutional government is by definition limited. Governments may be limited with either respect to their means or their ends. Constitutional government is both. It deliberately leaves some things outside the parameters of political control. For example, our government respects the individual's rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These belong to the discretion of the individual and it is the task of government to fulfill the function of protecting the exercise of each person's right to use or misuse their freedom as they see fit. A government that seeks to supervise every aspect of its citizens' private lives in the manner of, say, you know, Plato's Republic or something like that, is on, or, or modern systems of, of totalitarian rule, is on its way to the destruction of constitutionalism. The slogan, popular a generation ago or so, that the personal is political, already reveals a deeply totalitarian tendency. But the first and most fundamental way through which constitutional restraint is exercised is through the doctrine of consent. Consent is a way of limiting power by making it responsible to the governed. Constitutional government is above all responsible government. The governors are accountable to the governed. And that provided the core of Lincoln's opposition to slavery in the years leading up to his presidency. It was axiomatic for Lincoln, as he expressed in a number of occasions, that no individual is good enough to govern another without that other's consent. He called that belief the sheet anchor of American republicanism. That kind of restraint that comes from consent, the act of consent, was the very opposite of the doctrine of what was called popular sovereignty adopted by his great rival, Stephen A. Douglas, 
is the core in many ways of the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates. Douglas, the, the little giant as he was called, senator, distinguished senator from Illinois, architect of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the most important piece of territorial legislation for 25 years. Douglas had argued that it was the right of every state or territory to decide for itself whether it would permit slavery or not. It was for him a simple case of majority rule. The majority should decide, hence popular sovereignty. What the majority of people wanted within a desi designated territory was sufficient for him to decide the problem, was both necessary and sufficient to decide the problem. So Douglas could declare that it was a matter of what he called indifference to him, whether slavery was voted up or down. He meant by that it should be not, not that he personally was indifferent to slavery, and there was reason to believe that Douglas himself personally was opposed to slavery at least the extension of slavery, but he felt it should be a matter of indifference from the point of view of the national government, the federal government. It should simply be a local matter that, that states and territories should decide for themselves. But for Lincoln, this doctrine co constituted a teaching of unlimited majority rule that was a violation of the very principle of constitutional government. Constitutions are devices for restraining power whether that power be the power of a king or the power of a popular majority. If slavery is a good, Lincoln enjoyed chiding his audiences, then it is a good that no one has ever chosen for himself. And Lincoln used that kind of moral law, ask if you, how you would be treated, as in a way a measure for determining whether something could be an object of consent. It is consent that forms the essence of constitutional government, not the will of the changing will of the majority. Lincoln even implied, applied this doctrine of constitutional restraint to his views on presidential power, which may come as something of a surprise to you, because Lincoln made extraordinary use of his powers as a president during wartime. Among other things, of course, we know that Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus. He shut down opposition newspapers. He arrested anti-war agitators. And he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, all of which seemed to go well beyond the more limited powers of a constitutional executive. Lincoln characteristically defended these decisions on the grounds of what he called military necessity. They were measures he deemed necessary to save the Union. And as the commander-in-chief, he continually remarked he was vested with the authority to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. But the question here for Lincoln is, who is to judge this necessity? How is necessity to be judged? It seems to be a kind of all-purpose justification for almost anything. Were Lincoln's actions of the kind I described part of his constitutional office? Or in fact, were they a sort of foray into Machiavellianism? Doing anything necessary? Does invoking the necessity doctrine not invest the president in many ways with certain kinds of dictatorial powers? a conversation that was had many, many times over uh, during a recent administration. I want to consider, however, I mean, I can't go into all of these issues because there are way too many, but I want to look at two examples, what I think of as supreme examples of Lincoln's constitutional restraint, even and especially during wartime. Let me start with the Emancipation Proclamation, which many people believed went, exceeded his authority, limited authority as an executive power. When Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, he knew that he was doing something deeply radical. He knew he was vulnerable. I'll call them from those in his political right. It wouldn't be quite the language of his time, but I'll, I'll call them his political right. Those who were prepared to wage a war to defend the Union, but who would balk at the idea of continuing a war for the sake of the of emancipation of slaves, to bring about legal equality between the races. But there were also those from Lincoln's political left 
who believed that the Emancipation Proclamation did not go far enough. It had applied, and Lincoln was clear about this, it had applied only to those states then in rebellion, but said nothing about slavery in the border states where Lincoln was prepared to leave slavery alone. In other words, Lincoln abolished or attempted to abolish slavery in the places over which he had no control and left it alone in the places where he might have had some, some control. And Lincoln faced the ire of his Secretary of Treasury on this, Salmon P. Chase. Chase was a, was a Republican Party uh, luminary even before Lincoln. He was from Ohio. Uh, he wasn't exactly an abolitionist, but he would have been on Lincoln's left on the, uh, on the issue and was remained uh, even in Lincoln's cabinet deeply disgruntled uh, that, y you know, uh, he, he, with Lincoln, never liked Lincoln, uh, was a continual thorn in his side. Uh, and then uh, Lincoln caught a break uh, that uh, the uh, uh, long-standing uh, uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Roger Taney, the uh, you know architect or the, the infamous Dred Scott case, di died, and then uh, Lincoln appointed Chase to the to the role to, to, to the Supreme Court, get, thus getting rid of him, you know, mm -hmm. uh, getting rid of him, but not before. Uh, Chase was able to, uh, to uh, attack Lincoln in a letter uh, saying essentially that he had not gone, the proclamation had not gone far enough, to which Lincoln replied in a letter of September 2nd, 1863, if I take the step toward complete emancipation, which Chase was arguing in favor of, must I not do so, he wrote, without the argument of military necessity, and so without any argument, except the one that I think the measure politically expedient and morally right. Would I not thus give up all footing upon constitution or law? Would I not thus be in the boundless field of absolutism? In other words, once he let go of the argument from military necessity, what next? what next? It seemed to be unrestrained presidential executive <coughs> leadership. Would I not be in the boundless field of absolutism, he said. And Lincoln defended his emancipation measures on similar constitutional grounds in a famous public letter to Albert G. Hodges of the following year, April 4th, 1864. Hodges was a prominent <coughs> Kentucky newspaper editor from Frankfort, Kentucky, and therefore an important opinion maker in a key border state. Uh, Hodges and a senator uh, and a couple of other dignitaries from Kentucky had met with Lincoln in the, in the White House, uh, concerned particularly about Lincoln's use of black troops in the American army. They had had a conversation about this, and then subsequently Hodges asked Lincoln if he would put their, the gist of their conversation down in writing to which Lincoln wrote this public, public letter uh, intended for, for publication, uh, in which he defended on constitutional grounds what he was doing. After first in the letter avowing his lifelong hatred of slavery, I am naturally anti-slavery, he sla said, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. Lincoln then went on to argue that his oath of office, that is to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, did not allow him to act on his moral convictions alone. This meant that his understanding of emancipation was a means toward preserving constitutional order. Let me quote a passage from that letter. I did understand that my oath to preserve the Constitution to the best of my ability imposed upon me the duty of preserving by every indispensable means that government, that nation, of which the Constitution was the organic law. Was it possible, Lincoln asks, was it possible to lose the nation and yet preserve the Constitution? By general law, life and limb must be protected, yet often a limb must be amputated to save a life. But a life is never wisely given to save a limb. I felt that measures otherwise unconstitutional might become lawful by becoming indispensable to the preservation of the Constitution 
through the preservation of the nation. Right or wrong, I assumed this ground and now avow it. So there you see Lincoln in that passage saying, I felt that these measures, he says, otherwise unconstitutional, but under these extraordinary circumstances necessary for the preservation of the nation, uh, somehow made these acts constitutional. Right or wrong, he said, I avow. I avow them now. So there you see Lincoln's attempt to explain his actions, in this case, actions having to do with the Emancipation Proclamation and again the use of freed black slaves in the Union Army on constitutional, in terms of constitutional grounds. But a second case of Lincoln's exercise of constitutional restraint concerns the principle of election. His rejection of the secessionist thesis was that it made the operation of free government impossible. If a minority could secede every time it disapproved of the outcome of the vote of the majority, the result would be a descent into anarchy. That every group would eventually, there's a kind of logic of secession that would lead each group to secede and, and therefore may, make, again, constitutional government, self-government impossible. To be sure, Lincoln understood the vote of the majority does not confer an absolute power to do what it will. But the principle of regular election, he believed, could provide a check on what majorities would be prepared to do. In any case, to give the minority a permanent veto over the majority would be the negation of self-government. A majority held in restraint, he wrote, by constitutional checks and limitations and always changing easily with deliberate changes of popular opinions and sentiments is the only true sovereign of a free people he told his audience in the first inaugural. But as late as the summer of 1864, Lincoln fully expected to be a one-term president. And even those within his own party, at least some of them, were urging another candidate. Some even wondered whether the election should be postponed in the, in the midst of civil war, to postpone election. But on this point, Lincoln was firm in opposition. Suspending elections, even in the midst of civil war, was wrong, even if holding the election would have resulted in Lincoln's defeat and thereby the defeat of the cause of the Union. In a private memorandum, Lincoln wrote to himself, he said, this in August of 1864, this morning and for some days past, he said, it seems exceedingly probable that this administration will not be reelected. Then it will be my duty to so cooperate with the president elect so as to save the union between the election and the inauguration, as he will have secured his election on such ground that he cannot possibly save it afterwards. That note of despair, of course, turned out fortunately to be false. This was August of 1864. Uh, Sherman's troops marched through Atlanta, went to the sea. Uh, Grant's troops were pressing down from Virginia in the north. By the time of the election, public opinion had moved very much back in, Lincoln, back in Lincoln's direction. Yet, Lincoln didn't know that for a fact, and you, c you could never be in the midst of a, who, 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 who can, who, I mean, unless you're Nate Silver, who, who really knows. Uh, and yet, to his infinite credit, Lincoln realized that free elections should, should not, rather, even in principle, be sacrificed, even if the cost might be the end of constitutionalism itself. For constitutional leadership, in other words, the ends do not justify the means. Constitutional leadership is necessarily limited. It is in this possibility of a leader operating within, as he says, rule of law and sensitive to changing fluctuations of public opinion that the idea of constitutional government rests. So let me prepare to wrap this all up. Constitutional government, as I've tried to argue, is necessarily limited or bounded government. Unlike Machiavellian realpolitik, 
as I think Lincoln demonstrated in his willingness to stake everything on his reelection, the constitutional leader will not do whatever is necessary or whatever it takes to win. Machiavelli's princely legislators are like Lincoln's lions and eagles that he describes in his perpetuation <coughs> speech. That is, they belong almost to a different species of humanity. But for precisely this reason, such heroic founders are ill-suited to the more prosaic business of perpetuating constitutional rule. Yet constitutional leadership is similarly averse to Weber's charismatic leader. Although we are accustomed to speaking of our leaders, once again generally the ones we like, as being endowed with charismatic properties, this is clearly a vulgarization of what Weber meant. Weber feared what he thought was the increasing mechanization and routinization of political life, epitomized by the emergence of the modern bureaucratic state, the modern administrative state. He saw only a kind of the emergence of a charismatic leader as someone capable of revitalizing politics and by inspiring leaders with a sense of almost prophetic grace. I mean, there is something <coughs> actually very much to Weber's complaint about the nature of modern politics. One has to wonder in some ways whether his cure is not worse than the disease. Lincoln rejected, I mean without using Weber's language, he rejected the, the charismatic model as a form of moral narcissism, a form of moral solipsism that he saw in some respects in some of the abolitionist figures who put their own private conscience and their own private purity above the rule of law and the Constitution, to say nothing of moral fanatics like John Brown. Lincoln, as I try to illustrate by the letter to Hodges, rejected the idea that politics is the domain of following one's own private moral commitments because he always submitted his commitments to the priority of law. And finally, constitutional leadership is different from what I've been calling the progressive model as the voice or the tribune of the people. The progressive leader is not hemmed in by checks and balances. Rather, he has the ability to communicate directly with the people, the kind of bully pulpit model as we sometimes refer to it, and serve as the voice of their shifting moods and opinions. There is once again an indeterminacy about this model as the ends of progressive leadership remain dependent on the public uh, mood. I mean, hence our fascination with charting the most minute swings in, in public opinion. The important matter is that the executive stand is a mouthpiece of the public that he claims both to serve and to lead. But constitutional government, by contrast, is above all political government, political leadership, properly understood. That is to say, government under law. It is this devotion to law, or what in an early text Lincoln called the political religion of the nation, this kind of devotion to constitution and law in which the health and freedom of our republic rests. Thank you very much. I know some of you might have to go, but for those who can remain, uh, uh, we certainly have time for yeah. questions. At the uh, Constitutional Studies Program, we always like to have our undergraduate students ask the best questions. The floor is open. Yes, please. Okay. Please, and stand up and tell us your Sure. I'm Veronica. Um, you, um, I didn't really finish writing this, so the end might be a little shaky. Okay. But um, you spoke of like the willingness of the leader for um, Machiavelli's leadership no. to do what's necessary um, to get things done, mm. and for wait for Weber for like the charismatic yeah. leader, and like you outlined all the three, and then said mm -hmm. how Lincoln was not really a, like a fit in any of mm -hmm. these. But the way I saw it, and I'm not sure if you yes. can speak to this at all, is that he was not the, like any of the three, but he was mm -hmm. also like not the antithesis of either, but yeah. rather like a combination of all okay. of them. Um, mm -hmm. And so like, I don't know if you could speak to that a little no, bit. No, that's, that's fine. That's no, that's, that's excellent. No, you're, you're absolutely, I'm not, I'm not presenting these necessarily as kind of polar antitheses to, to one another. 
nor is Lincoln the antithesis to any of these. And to some degree, uh, I mean, I'm presenting a certain necessarily kind of schematic mod, you know, set of theories of leadership, but L Lincoln, uh, in, in a different mood, I would, would tell you that Lincoln shares some of the qualities of these different models. There, there is a progressivist side to Lincoln's understanding of executive, uh, of, of leadership. Uh, for example, you can say in some respects Lincoln did use power like a Machiavellian in, in some way. I don't want to argue that these are, are watertight categories that don't, can't bleed in, into one another. And Lincoln, to some degree, I, to, to concede a certain part, he does sh share some of these. However, for, for the sake of clarity, uh, I do want to argue that, that it's important to, to see what distinguishes Lincoln from different kinds of political leaders, different theories of leadership. And I do believe, uh, although the, the situation of civil war strains this dramatically, which makes him such an interesting case study, I mean, it's easy to sort of impose notions of self-restraint during ordinary peaceful times, what we call normal or dull politics, right? It's during a period of intense, almost existential crisis where you really see you really see what somebody's made of, and it was these examples of 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 exercising what I think of as kinds of constitutional restraint rather than just going all the way, Machiavellian way, or, that I think really characterized Lincoln. But you're absolutely right. This I'm not presenting these as somehow polar opposites from one another, and that in many ways a, a careful study of leadership would show how they they often blend into one another in, in, in a variety of ways, and Lincoln too. But thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Please. Uh, I'm David, and my question was, what do you think should be the main lesson or example that the politicians today should take from Lincoln and incorporate into their own political mm -hmm. process? Rule of law. Yeah. Rule of law. In a word, in a phrase, rule of law. Now that's a, that's a vast category under which one can do 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 a lot do a lot of things, but I think Link, Lincoln understood uh, the necessity of when in, when when uh, when arguing uh, or proposing even those radical changes. And there's nothing more radical in Lincoln's. It's it's easy now to downplay the <laughs> radicalism of the Emancipation Proclamation. It's easy to downplay that, but Lincoln knew when he issued it, he was taking an enormous gamble, an enormous gamble with, would, would, would people, would his allies in the North continue to fight for a cause where it had become emancipation and the abolition of slavery? Uh, he knew this was in taking an enormous risk, political risk, military risk, and because he could be accused of some justice, to be accused of, of redirecting the aims of the war against preserving the Union, or not simply for preserving the Union, but for ending slavery. And it, the, what, where I'm getting at in, in this is I think it, it's important, particularly in a, in a government such as ours, a constitutional government, that leaders understand the importance of invoking the Constitution and showing the constitutional authority for what they are doing, even in their most radical moments. We, we often, I think, forget that. Uh, you have to have the authority of the Constitution behind it. Lincoln understood this, and I think that would be a good lesson for many today. Let me have you repeat the question for the oh. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, yes, you, you've been so, I, I've seen, yeah, go ahead. Um, I have three objections that I would like you to respond okay. to. Um, the first is, by, I'm, I'm, my name is Ann Bowie and I'm a okay. Virginian. Mm -hmm. um, the first okay. is... I see um, where this is coming from, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, good, yeah. good. Um, yeah. But the first is, you're, you said that the basis of constitutional yeah. government is the consent of the government. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that the secession ordinances by the southern states, mm -hmm. which were ratified by the people, is mm -hmm. not the consent. Mm -hmm. And so I suppose that the modern United States Constitution does not require the consent of mm -hmm. southern mm -hmm. um, people. 
Um, secondly, the lie that you stated that Lincoln was opposed to slavery mm -hmm. from his own words in the first inaugural address. It is found in nearly all the published speeches of mm -hmm. he who now addresses you, Lincoln. I do but quote from one of those speeches when I declare that I have no purpose, directly mm -hmm. or indirectly, mm -hmm. to interfere with the institution of slavery mm -hmm. in the states where it exists. Mm -hmm. I believe I have no lawful right to do mm -hmm. so. And the important part, okay. and I have no inclination to right. do so. And thirdly, mm -hmm. um, he did not care about mm -hmm. slavery. He mm -hmm. cared about his abstract notion of union, which he invented right. and imposed upon the American mm -hmm. polity, um, and which he furthermore is in, is mm -hmm. in um, congruity with Hegelian okay. philosophy, as you well know, the idea of a union that pre-exists mm -hmm. its parts, right. um, and uh, <coughs> which he shares okay. in company with um, mm -hmm. all the major totalitarians of the 20th mm -hmm. century, including Hitler. I am um, mm -hmm. reading from Mein Kampf. Okay. Thus, too, the individual states of the American <coughs> Union are in mo are mm -hmm. had no state sovereignty of mm -hmm. their own, and could not have had any right. at all. For it was not these states which formed the Union, mm -hmm. but it was the Union which gave form to a great part of these so-called states. Mm -hmm. um, Hitler right. there reiterating the Lincoln myth of the Union that produces its parts. Okay. I also find it interesting when you're, when you, you're claim that he that no one mm -hmm. was of a greater constitutional example than right. Lincoln. No one. Mm -hmm. You mentioned none of the founders of the United mm -hmm. States. You mentioned what? Where are you coming from? Uh, well, that's a lot. There's a lot to answer in one in one question. There's a lot there. Let me try to do what, one or two of the points you you, you raise. Let me start with the. Um, remind me of the second one. The lie that he that he was against. Oh yes, right. Let me start with that one. Can you repeat it just so we can pick it the, up? The claim that that Lincoln, or the lie, as the young lady put it, that Lincoln was against was was against slavery and so on. Slavery. Yeah, I mean, let me start with that one because it's frequently charged, brought against Lincoln. Kind of probably most famous. <coughs> piece of evidence for this is the, is the letter, famous letter to Horace Greeley when he said, what I do, I do to preserve the Union. If I would emancipate everyone to save it, I'd do that, and slave people to save he, what he does to save the Union. Lincoln understood, uh, he clearly understood that emancipation was not a popular uh, proposal with, in many parts, many, even, within his own, even, within his own, with, even within his own political party. Uh, he was a politician. He understood. He, he understood the, the importance of being able to present an argument in ways that an audience would, as he said in one, in one famous speech, temperance speech, a drop of honey catches more flies than a gallon of gall. You have to bring people along with you. You have to speak to them in the language they understand in order to elicit from them eventually help where he wants to take them. And I would say that's, that's what Lincoln did. He often, with the talk of union, or with the talk of what I'm doing, I do to save the union, he spoke to people, his countrymen, in language, again, that they understood and would find appealing, to bring them along. And then to ultimately, I think, to uh, express, I mean, we can all take phrases out of context to show. I mean, he, in, 1854, in 1854, right, he, in the, he says slavery is a monstrous injustice. He said very early on, a, a monstrous injustice in the famous Peoria speech on the Kansas and Nebraska. So I'm just saying y you have to be, I think, a little more attentive to what I would call Lincoln's political rhetoric and the way in which the language is employed in a statesmanly way. And we can't just take these you know, phrases is, you know, here's what, Link, here, here, here in the Greeley letter is what Lincoln really meant, or, you know, I could take any other set of statements and find evidence for them as well. The first point uh, about secession uh, is the standard, in many ways, the, uh, the Confederate argument that the, uh, the, the Union is just a, a, uh, a, a um, contract of individual contracting members, uh, the old, what was called the compact theory of the union, that the states are sovereign entities that uh, 
agree for limited purposes to cooperate for trade or other things, and that they always have within it an, an exit clause that they can exercise to, to, to pull out of. You, you present this, and that was, that was argued uh, both before the war as well as after the war by Confederate apologists. I'm thinking particularly of Alexander S Stevens's history of the Constitution, which kind of made this theory the centerpiece of his, his, the of his theory of jurisprudence. And yet, uh, while the founders had not, uh, I would say, codified any such theory of union in writing, Lincoln drew with, with considerable plausibility to arguments, for example, uh, we the people to make a more perfect union uh, suggesting a greater uh, union of, 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 the, of the parts in, in relationship to the whole. Uh, he drew many other kinds of arguments against the uh, secessionist thesis, not only the one that the logic of secession is to devolve into anarchy, but one of the ones that I particularly enjoyed, I, I particularly liked, uh, that uh, many of the states then under claiming secession had been paid for by the government, by the national government. They were part of the Louisiana <laughs> Purchase. You know, we bought you. You know, we, we bought you fair and square. You, you can't you just, you know, you think you could just walk? I mean, we, 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 bought, we bought you. We paid for you. Who, who are you? You know, uh, that, that's, that's one of the arguments. I didn't really develop it, but I, I always liked it. It seemed to have a certain, uh, it seemed to have a sort of logic, economic logic to me, you know. And the last point about, you know, Hitler, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just not going to go there. Some uh, in the back. Uh, yes, the young lady in the back. Um, hi, my name is Elaine. Uh, I was wondering, since Lincoln did use such kind of extreme methods to promote mm -hmm. his view of mm -hmm. slavery, mm -hmm. and should you think that opens the door for future presidents to kind mm -hmm. of use similar? Give me an example of what you mean by extreme. Well, he like suspended his court. I see. Right, I see. Well, w when when w when we next confront a civil war, we'll we'll. I mean, uh, right. I mean, it, it's not. What your point is 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 well taken. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, I don't know if he cited Lincoln's authority for it, but I, I think particularly Roosevelt's internment of, of of the Japanese citizens during you know during the early early stages of World War II. I mean, president, particularly during wartime, extraordinary rendition under the Bush administration. You know, you could go down a list of uses of political power. Uh, uh, you know, probably the most, the most famous or infamous of them was, you know, uh, Richard Nixon's famous statement, if the president says it's law, it, it, it's law, uh, in, the, in the famous Frost interview. Uh, you know, but... Uh, you know, the wartime is 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 often uh, a very difficult time for for setting for setting policy. What strikes me again, what struck me, uh, is Lincoln's uh, use of constitutional limits and restraints. I mean, extraordinary power. Yes, I mean to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, absolutely. And yet. Uh, always trying to keep his moral convictions within the limits of, of law, on my view. Yes, with a Pepperdine. Is that Pepperdine? Sure. Yeah, okay. Uh, I was actually coming up back to the end of the uh -huh. question. Um, kind of, it's nice to look back at history and kind of analyze that. But mm -hmm. More practically thinking, uh, do you ever think there'll be a president kind of in the man that did things in the manner of Lincoln? You know, because I mean, more conviction is, Mm -hmm. change from the middle of the time, yeah. media, etc. Right. And also kind of, if you, I mean, you could say no. But yeah. if yes, like, we have to sort of put this side of political spectrum that this president would have to fall on. I'm sorry, the last part is? If, if there could be a president in the United I, States, I see. Future, what side of political spectrum? Oh, uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. And I think the fact that uh, although Lincoln was uh, in early, although not a um, founding member of the Republican Party, the fact that he's claimed, you know, with, with great plausibility by both parties today says something about his, I would say, transcendent character. Uh, 
Uh, I'm not sure that, uh, for one thing, I, I don't know if we're ever going to see another, I mean, it's, it's like sort of asking, well, are we going to see another Socrates or something like, well, you know, you, well, may, maybe, you can't, you, can't rule, you can't rule anything out in human, human affairs. And I don't, and I, I don't want to put, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the kind of person who wants to put Lincoln above history somehow, that is to say, a kind of secular saint of modern democracy. I mean, Lincoln was a political actor. I mean, he was a very great one, in my opinion. But uh, you know, he's not some someone who defies or uh, resists comparison. You know, reasonable comparison with with other political leaders who who, who you could who you could pl plaus plausibly point out. Um, the situation was an extraordinarily uh, unusual one, to say the least. Uh, but I, 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 I think uh, without, I, I don't want to get into the question of, you know, who, who, I mean, you know, I mentioned T.R. and Woodrow Wilson, both of whom were obsessed with Lincoln and wrote, wrote uh, about him at, at considerable length. Uh, but it's, it's, what you say is not implausible, it's not implausible by any means, and I think uh, a Lincolnian figure could, could be part of, 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 of either of our, of our two major political parties, as far as I can see. Yes, please. Hi, Elizabeth. Um, my question is a little bit more of a historical, yeah. hypothetical question. Um, but Lincoln's work was obviously cut short when he was assassinated. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have a sense of what he would have done or any plans he had for yeah. reconstruction of the South, which was a process that obviously it very, went on for decades. Yes, they're very... Uh, very provisional at the time of his death, very provisional at the time of his death. And the fact is, I don't think we have a very clear idea of what, the, what a Lincolnian reconstruction would have looked like. Uh, we do know at the, time, at, at, at the time of his assassination, he was beginning to um, entertain fuller prospects of political, pol not just economic, but political equality for, for freed blacks. There's a moment in the recent Spielberg movie where uh, it talks about this, uh, but I, I don't, uh, unless I'm mistaken, I, I, there, is, there was no blueprint, he left no blueprint or real model for what a, reconstruction, a reconstructed union would, would, would begin to look like, yeah. Uh, how about from this side of the room? Y yes, this young man. Um, in your talk, yeah. oh, my name is Mike, okay. by the way. In your talk, you use the words right and left when talking yeah. about the emancipation of right. to describe right. people there. Do you think that these are good words to use in the realm of political uh -huh. philosophy, or do they just kind of muddy the waters of our understanding? Uh, a, little, a little of both. I mean, some, some of both. Uh, I, I use them as, I, I would say, rather deliberately as kind of somewhat crude, you know, shorthand for, for different kind of political dispositions, uh, they exist in reality. I mean, philosophically, they may not be, you know, terms like left and right philosophically might not be very airtight or categories, but, you know, we all have some, you know, common, I would say common sense, uh, ordinary idea of what, what it refers to, and it was in this looser way that I was referring to it. So. So your answer, my answer to your question is a, a little of both, a little of both, yeah, please. Uh, my name's Alex. One of the many debates between Hamilton and Jefferson focused about this idea of constitutional leadership, about mm -hmm. whether or not the president should act outside the Constitution yeah. in certain exigencies, or as Hamilton would say, should act more within the Constitution and somehow mm -hmm. twist the Constitution to fit his meaning. Right. Um, from what you've said, it sounds like Lincoln would uh, identify more with Hamilton's position, mm -hmm. but wouldn't he be, have been better served by identifying with Jefferson's position and simply just doing what he thought was right and then apologizing for it later? As <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that would be one. That's one. That's one view. Uh, you know, no, I, I think you're you're right in identifying uh, Lincoln with the kind of Hamiltonian strain uh, in American politics, the Whig Party of which he was originally uh, a, a member, in which he. Uh, <laughs> Uh, defined himself in his early years was a, w they were the uh, you know the heirs of the Federalist disposition, the emphasis upon uh, internal improvements, which was a kind of standard view of Whig uh, Whig ideology of that 
period uh, comes out of the Ham Hamiltonian view of politics. Um, and uh, for, again, for various historical reasons, uh, the party, Je the Jeffersonian disposition t went into the Jacksonian direction, which Lincoln very much opposed early on, and through Jackson to Stephen A. Douglas. So you can see in that progression a kind of small d, you know, democratic movement towards what, what Douglas would call popular sovereignty, and, and with Lincoln's a more Whiggish disposition towards constitutionalism in, in some ways, and these, these two tendencies are, are, are very much there. However, I mean, Lincoln, may, maybe for rhetorical purposes, but I think more than that as well, always cited Jefferson, you know, the Declaration of Independence, because he, he, he enjoyed taking a page, in a way, from this, you might say, the spiritual and intellectual founder of the opposing party, and saying, "Here, you know, here's here's Jefferson, the founder of the, you know, the author of the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal, government by consent, natural rights, and so on." This this was what the true democracy. This was the true meaning of the de democracy was. So he enjoyed. I think he used. He 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 enjoyed using. Jefferson, because to some degree he was the, the property of the, the intellect, and he should have been the intellectual property of the other side, but he enjoyed co-opting him for his own purposes, I think, which turned out, I think, to be quite effective. Uh, in the back, yeah. Uh, Carson, due to part of the journal, I've got a theoretical question. Uh-oh. What are the differences, if okay. there are any yeah. the differences between what you call uh, constitutional leadership and what Max Weber has described as Legal, rational, yeah. mm -hmm. rational. Uh, uh, this is quite similar. I think. Uh, probably is in some ways. Uh, it it probably is in some ways. I don't. I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, maybe the maybe the rule. It it is it is the rule. It is the rule of law, and in that that respect, shares more with the, with with that with that Weberian notion. I think one of the problems is, or one of the differences between Weber and me, if not Weber and Lincoln. I won't, uh, I won't speak for Lincoln here necessarily, but uh, Weber tended to, I, if I'm correct in this, uh, Weber tended to see this kind of rational administrative leadership as leading to this mechanized, petrified theory of bureaucracy that needed uh, a charismatic figure precisely to kind of shake things up and break things up. Whereas I don't, you know, the famous Weberian image, you know, specialists of, without spirit, hedonists without heart, you know, in a way that is Weber's sort of view of, of where rational legal authority leads itself. Whereas I want to say, at any rate, that is a kind of authority, rule of law, uh, that we should be, that we should be protecting. And, and, and I think Weber, twists it in his own way for his own purpose and, and maybe the German situation is, is closer to that. He, he, does, he does have a point. I mean, you, you, yeah. you don't share his nightmare, but you share his typology. I'll, I'll go along with that. Oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. We have time for three more questions. Okay. I see two in the audience and then I'm going to pose the, okay. the final one. I, I know this, Matt, you've, you've had your hand up from the... Okay. Earlier you described the Spielberg movie as excellent. I wonder if you would elaborate oh. on that because it seems like it's portraying a more Machiavellian yeah. thinking. Mm -hmm. Uh, even though his goal is right. to utilize the form uh, and modify the Constitution. Right. So could you elaborate That's on fair that? enough. I mean, I, I do think that's, that is, uh, I, think that's a, I think that's a good description of the Spielberg-Lincoln. Uh, one of the things, uh, having said that, however, one of the things I liked about it, I mean, other than, I, and I didn't, I'm not coming here as a film critic, by the way, but one of the things, as you know, uh, but one of the things I liked about it, uh, other than I thought the beautiful historical reconstruction of the period and so That's on, and the d watching. detail. But, uh, you know, we do have an image of Lincoln, uh, to use a phrase, as the, as the saint of modern democracy in, in some ways. Uh, you know, the author of the Gettysburg Address and the Second Inaugural and so on, and we kind of take these out of, almost outside of history and elevate them to a, and Lincoln, you know, Lincoln was a politician uh, too, and uh, ma did Spielberg go, 
too far in emphasizing that, that Lincoln, as it were, the kind of savvy wielder of political power. Well, I think that that's, that's clearly part of his, of his narrative, but uh, I think it's a good one. I mean, I think it's, I think it's, a, I think it's a good story. It, it, tell, it tells a side of Lincoln, a real side of Lincoln, that I, I think is, is, worth, is worth bringing his Americans along with, his audience along with. So I know maybe we could argue later, but I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I, I, lo I love the movies. I, I can't find re real uh, complaint, you know, it would be ungenerous. Uh, there were three others. Uh, Connor? Yes. Okay. Um, um, I, uh, I was wondering um, if you could talk a little more. How can we juxtapose Lincoln with the uh, rule of law? Um, someone mentioned earlier that uh, you know he suspended habeas corpus, mm -hmm. placed sanctions in the South, and um, it just seems like what good is there of having a constitution if you're just going to go against it in time of war? Mm -hmm. You know, there's no point in having a law saying that right. you can't be enhanced interrogation um, unless you're a prisoner of war. Mm -hmm. Just doesn't make sense, and uh, so I'm not going to talk about that order. Right. And I think now, honestly, it's a precedence for presidents to do mm -hmm. whatever they want. Like, okay. With our president now sending drone strikes mm -hmm. in the Middle East, um, mm -hmm. the definite detention clause in the AA. Mm -hmm. um, I just think like what mm -hmm. Lincoln did. Uh, I said a lot of bad presidents for our country. Right. Now. Well, okay. Fair, fair, fair enough. Uh, let me just say one thing. I mean. You know, just because things happen, you know, after one another doesn't imply there's a causal law that, that, that connect, connects them. I mean, you know, you can take that back f forever, you know. Why, why stop at Lincoln? Why not go, go back to some other point in the past or in, into the future? So I'm, be careful about how we ascribe causal responsibility for what comes later to what went earlier. I, I would say that uh, as a general kind of res response. And, and uh, I'm sort of, oh, what, what, what's the point of having rule of law if, if, it's, if it's going to be broken or some constitution if it's going to be broken? Well, we can't, you know, in, in politics or in, in, in history, we, we can't, uh, we can't choose our, as, as, as someone once said, we, uh, history is made by us, but not in the way we necessarily would, would like, some, something to that effect. We can't choose, cho we, we would love to live, we would like to live under ideal circumstances where we never had to make these difficult decisions between, you know, strict adherence to law and, and the, the issues that you talk about, but we, we don't we don't always have we don't always have those choices. Politics, uh, the, the one of the great uh, challenges, joys, you know, of studying history is seeing these crisis moments where people stand up or don't stand up to to their to their situations. Uh, Wait, Chir so Churchill in 1939 or 40, you know, you can, we have many many examples. <coughs> Of this, uh, we don't always choose our. We don't choose. We don't always have the right. We don't have the ability to choose our enemies and to choose our situations. So, does that mean we can? We should just reject all rules because sometimes we find ourselves in a situation that's going to strain and stretch those rules. I think. I think no. We have to be realists and accept, and in many ways uh, accommodate ourselves to what what we have. Would but you you're but you're an ide you're an idealist. I can I can tell, and I I appreciate I appreciate that. But would you so mm -hmm. easily grant that mm -hmm. uh, take habeas corpus because that's yeah. what that's been mentioned okay. several times? Would you so easily grant that Lincoln trespassed the Constitution? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's right. there's a real debate here, yes. right? It's not so obvious. Yes. J just to clarify, so the, the writ of habeas corpus can be suspended in the Constitution, um, but it's not so clear who can suspend it. What branch of government? Mm -hmm. When Lincoln suspended it, Congress was not in session. So is it simply unreasonable or yeah. obviously unconstitutional? Yeah. What well, you did? that's that's excellent. Thanks. I uh, hadn't remembered that, but it, I mean, yeah, constitutional scholars very much differ on, on this on this question of whether Lincoln trespassed beyond his executive authority or not. And Lincoln always cited the Constitution that gave him the power to do this during times of d during times of war. Uh, Right. I, yes. Okay. Thanks. And, and okay, one, so let me, one let me, more. Let me yeah. With, uh, okay. Go ahead. 
I know a few more of you have questions, and we can, I'm sure Professor Smith will stay to answer all of them. But um, two questions that I might ask. Uh, so you just spent, uh, I'm sure, many years reading almost everything by Lincoln, if not mm -hmm. everything. Uh, my first question, what, what did you learn from Lincoln that one wouldn't know if one hadn't read all these documents? Mm -hmm. Was there something surprising you, you found? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, maybe the opposite direction, if a student wanted to read one or two or maybe three Lincoln documents yeah. um, tonight, for example, uh, what would you have them read? Uh, yeah, let me start with the second one first. That's a little. That's possibly a, a little bit easier. Thanks for those those questions, Philip. Um, I'm not. I'll, let me suggest two or three things. Maybe not the obvious. Uh, you know, it would be easy to say Gettysburg Address, Second Inaugural, something. I, let me not. Let me not do that. Let me <coughs> suggest Lincoln's Cooper Institute speech. Uh, an extraordinary speech given in New York on the way of an Eastern swing uh, in 1860, uh, which I think is a, just a you know extraordinary place to begin. Um, I would <laughs> I would recommend highly a one-page text, his letter. Uh, and I forget of which date it is, and there may, may be, it's in, in most anthologies, there's only one in my, his letter to his general, Joseph Hooker, which is an extraordinary piece of, I would say, Lincolnian character analysis. Uh, and if you want to know, is I sometimes wonder, how does a civilian leader speak to a general? <laughs> Looked at that letter, it's, it's brilliant. And since you gave me a chance for three, let me let me also add. Um, I'll add another letter because I, I love the letters. The speeches get more than enough tension. The letters are, are extraordinary. The letter to Joshua Speed of 1856, where he talks in quite vivid, personal tones, which is un unusual in Lincoln's corpus. Uh, about a trip he took down the Mississippi, seeing slavery, and says in the letters, you don't know how we of the North must crucify our feelings to you of the South in order to retain our loyalty to the extraordinary letter for its personal quality in which he personalizes the issue. Which, again, which he rarely does. For Link Lincoln, the slavery issue was always presented in, in rather cool, analytical, language of right, natural rights and so on. So the letter, to, the letter to Speed, the letter to Hooker, and the uh, Cooper Institute is, uh, address. What, what do, I, I think the, the first question is a really, is a really interesting and uh, tough question. What, what was surprising about Lincoln? And maybe, in a way, what was surprising uh, may not sound actually all that surprising. Uh, but when I f when I f what what always impresses me is I would say exactly one of the things I said about what what makes the letter to Speed so uh, unusual in, in a way uh, the coolness of of Lin and I don't mean that in the uh, modern sense of c cool but uh, the, the 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 unimpassioned rigorous quality character of the thought Herndon his early biographer said something to the effect that Lincoln's reasonings, and I think I have this right, were cold, clear, and exact. I may be forgetting one other, cold, clear, and exact. And I think it is, it is the very uh, cool, once again, the kind of coolness and, and rigor of Lincoln's political thinking that, that most impresses. Let me just get back to this. Oh, he left. But let me just get back to the spiel. There was one moment which I thought was very nice, captured some of that, when Lincoln's kind of reflecting on, uh, on, on, on the amendment. And he, he remembers reading Euclid. Uh, as a, Euclid's elements as a young man and says, you know, if one, if w according to Euclid, if one line is, if one, if A is equal to B, then they're equal to each other and use that kind of Euclidean logic, which is very typical in some ways of his, to, to ar arrive at 
the principles of equality. And it's and very unusual, striking, uh, particularly for a political figure who, you know, we, we don't expect to necessarily be clear or, you know, particularly solid reasoners. And his, his attempt to, th that's what always impresses me about Lincoln's thinking. But thanks, yeah. Well, thank you for all the questions, especially the difficult ones. Uh, thank you. 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 Thank you.